The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo, Book 14. Chapter 13. Our first parents fell into open disobedience, because already they were secretly corrupted. For the evil act had never been done, had not an evil will preceded it. And what is the origin of our evil will but pride? For pride is the beginning of sin. And what is pride but the craving for undue exaltation? And this is undue exaltation, when the soul abandons him to whom it ought to cleave as its end, and becomes a kind of end to itself. This happens when it becomes its own satisfaction. And it does so when it falls away from that unchangeable good which ought to satisfy it more than itself. This falling away is spontaneous. For if the will had remained steadfast in the love of that higher and changeless good by which it was illumined to intelligence and kindled into love, it would not have turned away to find satisfaction in itself, and so become frigid and benighted. The woman would not have believed the serpent spoke the truth, nor would the man have preferred the request of his wife to the command of God, nor have supposed that it was a venial transgression to cleave to the partner of his life, even in a partnership of sin. The wicked deed, then, that is to say, the transgression of eating the forbidden fruit, was committed by persons who were already wicked. That evil fruit could be brought forth only by a corrupt tree. But that the tree was evil was not the result of nature, for certainly it could become so only by the vice of the will, and vice is contrary to nature. Now nature could not have been depraved by vice had it not been made out of nothing. Consequently, that it is a nature, this is because it is made by God, but that it falls away from him, this is because it is made out of nothing. But man did not so fall away as to become absolutely nothing, but being turned towards himself, his being became more contracted than it was when he clave to him who supremely is. Accordingly, to exist in himself, that is, to be his own satisfaction after abandoning God, is not quite to become a non-entity, but to approximate to that. And therefore the Holy Scriptures designates the proud by another name, self-pleasers. For it is good to have the heart lifted up, yet not to oneself, for this is proud, but to the Lord, for this is obedient, and can be the act only of the humble. There is, therefore, something in humility which, strangely enough, exalts the heart, and something in pride which debases it. This seems indeed to be contradictory, that loftiness should debase, and lowliness exalt. But pious humility enables us to submit to what is above us, and nothing is more exalted above us than God. And therefore humility, by making us subject to God, exalts us. But pride, being a defect of nature, by the very act of refusing subjection and revolting from him who is supreme, falls to a low condition, and then comes to pass what is written, Thou castedst them down when they lifted up themselves. For he does not say, when they had been lifted up, as if they first were exalted and then afterwards cast down, but when they lifted up themselves, even then they were cast down, that is to say, the very lifting up was already a fall. And therefore it is that humility is specially recommended to the city of God as it sojourns in this world, and is specially exhibited in the city of God, and in the person of Christ its King. While the contrary vice of pride, according to the testimony of the sacred writings, specially rules his adversary the devil. And certainly this is the great difference which distinguishes the two cities of which we speak, the one being the society of the godly men, the other of the ungodly, each associated with the angels that adhere to their party, and the one guided and fashioned by love of self, the other by love of God. The devil, then, would not have ensnared man in the open and manifest sin of doing what God had forbidden, had man not already begun to live for himself. It was this that made him listen with pleasure to the words, Ye shall be as gods, which they would much more readily have accomplished by obediently adhering to their supreme and true end than by proudly living to themselves. For created gods are gods not by virtue of what is in themselves, but by a participation of the true God. By craving to be more, man becomes less, and by aspiring to be self-sufficing, he fell away from him who truly suffices him. Accordingly, this wicked desire which prompts man to please himself as if he were himself light, and which thus turns him away from that light by which, had he followed it, he would himself have become light, 
This wicked desire, I say, already secretly existed in him, and the open sin was but its consequence. For that is true which is written, Pride goeth before destruction, and before honour is humility. That is to say, secret ruin precedes open ruin, while the former is not counted ruin. For who counts exaltation ruin, though no sooner is the highest forsaken, than a fall is begun? But who does not recognize it as ruin, when there occurs an evident and indubitable transgression of the commandment? And consequently God's prohibition had reference to such an act, as, when committed, could not be defended on any pretense of doing what was righteous. And I make bold to say that it is useful for the proud to fall into an open and indisputable transgression, and so displease themselves, as already by pleasing themselves they had fallen. For Peter was in a healthier condition when he wept and was dissatisfied with himself, than when he boldly presumed and satisfied himself. And this is averred by the sacred psalmist when he says, Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord." that is, that they who have pleased themselves in seeking their own glory may be pleased and satisfied with thee in seeking thy glory. Chapter 14 But it is a worse and more damnable pride which casts about for the shelter of an excuse, even in manifest sins, as these our first parents did, of whom the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Here there is no word of begging pardon, no word of entreaty for healing. For though they do not, like Cain, deny that they have perpetrated the deed, yet their pride seeks to refer its wickedness to another, the woman's pride to the serpent, the man's to the woman. But where there is a plain transgression of a divine commandment, this is rather to accuse than to excuse oneself. For the fact that the woman sinned on the serpent's persuasion, and the man at the woman's offer, did not make the transgression less, as if there were any one whom we ought rather to believe or yield to than God. Chapter 15 Therefore, because the sin was a despising of the authority of God, who had created man, who had made him in his own image, who had set him above the other animals, who had placed him in paradise, who had enriched him with abundance of every kind and of safety, who had laid upon him neither many nor great nor difficult commandments, but, in order to make a wholesome obedience easy to him, had given him a single very brief and very light precept, by which he reminded that creature whose service was to be free, that he was Lord. It was just that condemnation followed, and condemnation such that man, who by keeping the commandment should have been spiritual even in his flesh, became fleshly even in his spirit. And as in his pride he had sought to be his own satisfaction, God in his justice abandoned him to himself, not to live in the absolute independence he affected, but instead of the liberty he desired, to live dissatisfied with himself in a hard and miserable bondage to him to whom by sinning he had yielded him himself, doomed in spite of himself to die in body as he had willingly become dead in spirit, condemned even to eternal death, had not the grace of God delivered him, because he had forsaken eternal life. Whoever thinks such punishment either excessive or unjust shows his inability to measure the great iniquity of sinning, where sin might so easily have been avoided. For as Abraham's obedience is with justice pronounced to be great, because the thing commanded to kill his son was very difficult, so in paradise the disobedience was the greater, because the difficulty of that which was commanded was imperceptible. And as the obedience of the second man was the more laudable, because he became obedient even unto death, so the disobedience of the first man was the more detestable, because he became disobedient even unto death. For where the penalty annexed to disobedience is great, and the thing commanded by the Creator is easy, who can sufficiently estimate how great a wickedness it is, in a matter so easy not to obey the authority of so great a power, even when that power deters with so terrible a penalty? In short, to say all in a word, what but disobedience was the punishment of disobedience in that sin? For what else is man's misery but his own disobedience to himself, so that in consequence of his not being willing to do what he could do, he now wills to do what he cannot? 
For though he could not do all things in paradise before he sinned, yet he wished to do only what he could do, and therefore he could do all things he wished. But now, as we recognize in his offspring, and as divine scripture testifies, man is like to vanity. For who can count how many things he wishes which he cannot do, so long as he is disobedient to himself, that is, so long as his mind and his flesh do not obey his will? For in spite of himself his mind is both frequently disturbed, and his flesh suffers, and grows old, and dies. And in spite of ourselves we suffer whatever else we suffer, and which we would not suffer if our nature absolutely and in all its parts obeyed our will. But is it not the infirmities of the flesh which hamper it in its service? Yet what does it matter how its service is hampered, so long as the fact remains, that by the just retribution of the sovereign God whom we refuse to be subject to and serve, our flesh, which was subjected to us, now torments us by insubordination, although our disobedience brought trouble on ourselves, not upon God? For he is not in need of our service as we of our bodies, and therefore what we did was no punishment to him, but what we receive is so to us. And the pains which are called bodily are pains of the soul in and from the body. For what pain or desire can the flesh feel by itself and without the soul? But when the flesh is said to desire or to suffer, it is meant, as we have explained, that the man does so, or some part of the soul which is affected by the sensation of the flesh, whether a harsh sensation causing pain, or gentle causing pleasure. But pain in the flesh is only a discomfort of the soul arising from the flesh, and a kind of shrinking from its suffering, as the pain of the soul which is called sadness is a shrinking from those things which have happened to us in spite of ourselves. But sadness is frequently preceded by fear, which is itself in the soul, not in the flesh, while bodily pain is not preceded by any kind of fear of the flesh, which can be felt in the flesh before the pain. But pleasure is preceded by a certain appetite which is felt in the flesh like a craving, as hunger and thirst and that generative appetite which is most commonly identified with the name lust, though this is the generic word for all desires. For anger itself was defined by the ancients as nothing else than the lust of revenge, although sometimes a man is angry even at inanimate objects which cannot feel his vengeance, as when one breaks a pen or crushes a quill that writes badly. Yet even this, though less reasonable, is in its way a lust of revenge, and is, so to speak, a mysterious kind of shadow of the great law of retribution, that they who do evil should suffer evil. There is therefore a lust for revenge which is called anger, there is a lust of money which goes by the name of avarice, there is a lust of conquering, no matter by what means, which is called opinionativeness, there is a lust of applause which is named boasting. There are many and various lusts, of which some have names of their own, while others have not. For who could readily give a name to the lust of ruling, which yet has a powerful influence in the soul of tyrants, as civil wars bear witness? Chapter 16 Although, therefore, lust may have many objects, yet when no object is specified, the word lust usually suggests to the mind the lustful excitement of the organs of generation. And this lust not only takes possession of the whole body and outward members, but also makes itself felt within, and moves the whole man with a passion in which mental emotion is mingled with bodily appetite, so that the pleasure which results is the greatest of all bodily pleasures. So possessing indeed is this pleasure, that at the moment of time in which it is consummated all mental activity is suspended. What friend of wisdom and holy joys, who, being married, but knowing, as the Apostle says, how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the disease of desire, as the Gentiles who know not God, would not prefer, if this were possible, to beget children without this lust, so that in this function of begetting offspring the members created for this purpose should not be stimulated by the heat of lust, but should be actuated by his volition, in the same way as his other members serve him for their respective ends. But even those who delight in this pleasure are not moved to it at their own will, whether they confine themselves to lawful or transgress to unlawful pleasures, but sometimes this lust importunes them in spite of themselves, and sometimes fails them when they desire to feel it, so that though lust rages in the mind, it stirs not in the body. 
Thus, strangely enough, this emotion not only fails to obey the legitimate desire to beget offspring, but also refuses to serve lascivious lust. And though it often opposes its whole combined energy to the soul that resists it, sometimes also it is divided against itself, and while it moves the soul, leaves the body unmoved. Chapter 17 Justly is shame very specially connected with this lust. Justly, too, these members themselves, being moved and restrained not at our will, but by a certain independent autocracy, so to speak, are called shameful. Their condition was different before sin. For as it is written, they were naked and were not ashamed. Not that their nakedness was unknown to them, but because nakedness was not yet shameful, because not yet did lust move those members without the will's consent, not yet did the flesh by its disobedience testify against the disobedience of man. For they were not created blind as the unenlightened vulgar fancy, for Adam saw the animals to whom he gave names, and of Eve we read, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Their eyes therefore were open, but were not open to this, that is to say, were not observant as to recognize what was conferred upon them by the garment of grace, for they had no consciousness of their members warring against their will. But when they were stripped of this grace, that their disobedience might be punished by fit retribution, there began in the movement of their bodily members a shameless novelty which made nakedness indecent. It at once made them observant, and made them ashamed." And therefore, after they violated God's command by open transgression, it is written, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. The eyes of them both were opened, not to see, for already they saw, but to discern between the good they had lost and the evil into which they had fallen. And therefore also the tree itself, which they were forbidden to touch, was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from this circumstance, that if they ate of it, it would impart to them this knowledge. For the discomfort of sickness reveals the pleasure of health." They knew, therefore, that they were naked, naked of that grace which prevented them from being ashamed of bodily nakedness, while the law of sin offered no resistance to their mind. And thus they obtained a knowledge which they would have lived in blissful ignorance of, had they, in trustful obedience to God, declined to commit that offense which involved them in the experience of the hurtful effects of unfaithfulness and disobedience. And therefore, being ashamed of the disobedience of their own flesh, which witnessed their disobedience while it punished it, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, that is, cinctures for their privy parts. For some interpreters have rendered the word by succinctoria. Campestria is, indeed, a Latin word, but it is used of the drawers or aprons used for a similar purpose by the young men who stripped for exercise in the campus. Hence those who were so girt were commonly called campestrati. Shame modestly covered that which lust disobediently moved in opposition to the will, which was thus punished for its own disobedience. Consequently all nations, being propagated from that one stock, have so strong an instinct to cover the shameful parts, that some barbarians do not uncover them even in the bath, but wash with their drawers on. In the dark solitudes of India also, though some philosophers go naked, and are therefore called gymnosophists, yet they make an exception in the case of these members, and cover them. CHAPTER Eighteen. Lust requires for its consummation darkness and secrecy, and this not only when unlawful intercourse is desired, but even such fornication as the earthly city has legalized. Where there is no fear of punishment, these permitted pleasures still shrink from the public eye. Even where provision is made for this lust, secrecy also is provided. And while lust found it easy to remove the prohibitions of law, shamelessness found it impossible to lay aside the veil of retirement. For even shameless men call this shameful, and though they love the pleasure, dare not display it. What, does not even conjugal intercourse, sanctioned as it is by law for the propagation of children, legitimate and honorable though it be, does it not seek retirement from every eye? Before the bridegroom fondles his bride, does he not exclude the attendants, and even the paranymphs, and such friends as the closest ties have admitted to the bridal chamber? The greatest master of Roman eloquence says that all right actions wish to be set in the light, that is, desire to be known. This right action, however, has such a desire to be known that yet it blushes to be seen. 
Who does not know what passes between husband and wife that children may be born? Is it not for this purpose that wives are married with such ceremony? And yet, when this well-understood act is gone about for the procreation of children, not even the children themselves, who may already have been born to them, are suffered to be witnesses. This right action seeks the light in so far as it seeks to be known, but yet dreads being seen. And why so, if not because that which is by nature fitting and decent is so done as to be accompanied with the shame-begetting penalty of sin? Chapter 19 Hence it is that even the philosophers who have approximated to the truth have avowed that anger and lust are vicious mental emotions, because even when exercised towards objects which wisdom does not prohibit, they are moved in an ungoverned and inordinate manner, and consequently need the regulation of mind and reason. And they assert that this third part of the mind is posted, as it were, in a kind of citadel, to give rule to these other parts, so that while it rules and they serve, man's righteousness is preserved without a breach. These parts, then, which they acknowledge to be vicious even in a wise and temperate man, so that the mind, by its composing and restraining influence, must bridle and recall them from those objects towards which they are unlawfully moved, and give them access to those which the law of wisdom sanctions, that anger, for example, may be allowed for the enforcement of a just authority, and lust for the duty of propagating offspring, these parts, I say, were not vicious in paradise before sin, for they were never moved in opposition to a holy will towards any object from which it was necessary that they should be withheld by the restraining bridle of reason. For though now they are moved in this way, and are regulated by a bridling and restraining power, which those who live temperately, justly, and godly exercise, sometimes with ease, and sometimes with greater difficulty, this is not the sound health of nature, but the weakness which results from sin. And how is it that shame does not hide the acts and words dictated by anger or other emotions, as it covers the motions of lust, unless because the members of the body which we employ for accomplishing them are moved, not by the emotions themselves, but by the authority of the consenting will? For he who in his anger rails at or even strikes some one, could not do so were not his tongue and hand moved by the authority of the will, as also they are moved when there is no anger." But the organs of generation are so subjected to the rule of lust that they have no motion but what it communicates. It is this we are ashamed of, it is this which blushingly hides from the eyes of onlookers. And rather will a man endure a crowd of witnesses when he is unjustly venting his anger on some one, than the eye of one man when he innocently copulates with his wife. Chapter 20 it is this which those canine or cynic philosophers have overlooked, when they have, in violation of the modest instincts of men, boastfully proclaimed their unclean and shameless opinion, worthy indeed of dogs, that, as the matrimonial act is legitimate, no one should be ashamed to perform it openly, in the street or in any public place. Instinctive shame has overborne this wild fancy. For though it is related that Diogenes once dared to put his opinion in practice, under the impression that his sect would be all the more famous if his egregious shamelessness were deeply graven in the memory of mankind, yet this example was not afterwards followed. Shame had more influence with them to make them blush before men than error to make them affect a resemblance to dogs. And possibly even in the case of Diogenes and those who did imitate him, there was but an appearance and pretense of copulation, and not the reality. Even at this day there are still cynic philosophers to be seen, for these are cynics who are not content with being clad in the pallium, but also carry a club, yet no one of them dares to do this that we speak of. If they did, they would be spat upon, not to say stoned, by the mob." Human nature, then, is without doubt ashamed of this lust, and justly so, for the insubordination of these members, and their defiance of the will, are the clear testimony of the punishment of man's first sin. And it was fitting that this should appear specially in those parts by which is generated that nature which has been altered for the worse by that first and great sin, that sin from whose evil connection no one can escape, unless God's grace expiate in him individually that which was perpetrated to the destruction of all in common, when all were in one man, and which was avenged by God's justice. Chapter 21 
Far be it then from us to suppose that our first parents in paradise felt that lust which caused them afterwards to blush and hide their nakedness, or that by its means they should have fulfilled the benediction of God, increase and multiply and replenish the earth, for it was after sin that lust began. It was after sin that our nature, having lost the power it had over the whole body, but not having lost all shame, perceived, noticed, blushed at, and covered it. But that blessing upon marriage which encouraged them to increase and multiply and replenish the earth, though it continued even after they had sinned, was yet given before they sinned, in order that the procreation of children might be recognized as part of the glory of marriage, and not of the punishment of sin. But now, men, being ignorant of the blessedness of paradise, supposed that children could not have been begotten there in any other way than they know them to be begotten now, that is, by lust, at which even honourable marriage blushes, some not simply rejecting, but sceptically deriding the divine scriptures, in which we read that our first parents, after they sinned, were ashamed of their nakedness, and covered it, while others, though they accept and honour scripture, yet conceive that this expression, increase and multiply, refers not to carnal fecundity, because a similar expression is used of the soul in the words, that will multiply me with strength in my soul, and so too in the words which follow in Genesis, and replenish the earth and subdue it, they understand by the earth the body which the soul fills with its presence, and which it rules over when it is multiplied in strength. And they hold that children could no more then than now be begotten without lust, which, after sin, was kindled, observed, blushed for, and covered. And even that children would not have been born in paradise, but only outside of it, as in fact it turned out. For it was after they were expelled from it, that they came together to beget children, and begot them. End of Book 14, Chapters 13-21